You are looking at some of the last remains of the Stonehenge Monument of Nabta, which was abandoned around 5000 BC when the lake around it dried up. The people who built that monument migrated into the Nile Valley and are said to be the founders of the first dynasty of Egypt. They brought with them the trappings of their culture and their civilization, which was based around a cattle cult, including goddess Hathor. This statue stands in the Luxor Museum in Egypt. This gold-covered cow's head is also a symbol of Hathor, who was the goddess of love and music. You are now looking at the northern funerary pyramids of the ancient kingdom of Kush in Meroe. And this is a view of the pyramid of Queen Ashafakato. Her pyramid was plundered by Giuseppe Ferlini in 1829, and gold jewelry such as that one was taken from there. These monuments are found in the Sudan and are temples of ancient Meroe. The lion god of war, Appomattox, is represented here. This is a wall of the temple of Queen Amafashato, which now stands in the British Museum. It was dismantled by fortune hunter Giuseppe Ferlini when he plundered it for its gold, jewelry, and treasures. If you look closely, you can see representations of the royal family, the queen, the king, represented as a sphinx, the royal court, the soldiers, and others. This is a fresco of Pharaoh Tutmosis III of the 18th dynasty who colonized ancient Nubia. And this is a fresco from Beth el Wadi showing Ramses II receiving his taxes and tribute from the ancient Nubians. A look at the soldiers of Queen Candace of Meroe. This ancient black granite stela depicts a treaty that was signed by Candace Amineris and Caesar Augustus in 23 BC. This is a statue of the famous Pharaoh Taharqa, which stands in the British Museum today of the 25th dynasty around 700 BC. And this is part of the Nubian exhibit in the British Museum. Kanum, the potter, molding people from clay. And these golden flies were symbols of valor given to Nubian and Egyptian soldiers indicating their tenacity. These throwing sticks, strangely reminiscent of boomerangs, uh, were used thousands of years ago. This fresco, taken from a Nubian governor of Thebes, shows the bounty of Nubia that was given to the Egyptians. Prince Hennifer of Miam bowing before King Tutankhamun. And this fresco shows Prince Arkenahera smiting his enemies in the first century AD. The gold of Nubia produced exquisite jewelry. And this is Bishop Marianus from 1000 AD of the Christian era of Balana. We are now flying over modern day Nubia on our way to visit the ancient temple of Abu Simbo, built by Ramses II in the 19th dynasty. Next to Ramses's temple was an exquisite temple built for his paramount queen Nefertari, a Nubian princess. When the High Aswan Dam was built between 1960 and 1970, both of these temples were carved in their entirety and moved 250 feet up to save them from the flooding waters. 
domes had to be built to house the interiors of the temple, which are exquisitely dressed on the inside, showing the philosophies, religions, and deities of the ancient Egyptians. Ramses escorting his queen on either side for protection. And here I am attempting to interpret some of the hieroglyphics which named Ramses's sons and daughters who were seated around his feet along with many of his paramount wives. And here's a look at the Holy of Holies at the interior of the temple where Ramses had himself seated with the gods. Inside the temple are enormous frescoes showing Ramses in victorious battle over the Hittites around 1200 BC. History actually records that this battle was a draw, but in Ramses's depiction, the Hittites are begging him for mercy as he storms their cities in Palestine. And in the upper register, we have Ramses paying homage to the gods Toth, Sekhmet, and Amun-Ra. And here are some of the ancient enormous columns of Ramses which helped to hold up the temple. A cleaned up fresco of Nefertari inside of her temple. Amun-Ra, one of the paramount gods of Egypt. And here is the Holy of Holies showing Ramses seated with Amun-Ra, Horakti, and the other gods. Amun-Ra receiving tribute from Ramses II. And inside of the library in the Temple of Abu Simbel, it is said that one would never forget anything one read there. Queen Nefertari inside of her temple. One can see that it has been uh, greatly refurbished scraping off the uh, detritus of the millenniums. Amun-Ra escorting the royal couple. The goddess Ma'at with the feather of truth in her hair. And this is a look at Lake Nasser, also called the Nubian Sea. And we're looking south into the Sudan, into ancient Meroe at sunset. This enormous statue of Pharaoh Tutmosis III stands in the British Museum. And this is a black granite statue of Sinwosway I of the 12th dynasty. This is also a statue of Sinwosway I from Luxor. And this is a statue of Sinwosway III, also of the 12th dynasty, who also colonized Nubia during their era. And this is a statue of Pharaoh Amenophis III of the 18th dynasty. Another statue of Pharaoh Amenophis III which stands in the British Museum. And here, carved in the black granite of Nubia, is an exquisite statue of a scribe kneeling with the goddess Hathor. And this magnificent golden sarcophagus was prepared for a famous singer of the 18th dynasty in Luxor, Thebes Waset, who died around 3,400 years ago. Pharaoh Taharqa being protected by Amun-Ra. On our way to Egypt, we were fortunate to encounter an exquisite ex display of golden jewelry, which was taken from ancient Meroe by Giuseppe Ferrellini in 1829. These golden shield rings were taken from that pyramid which was destroyed in order to find these ancient exquisite pieces of jewelry. The jewelry itself depicts the philosophy, the religion, and the workmanship of the ancient people of Meroe and Kush. It is interesting to see that cowrie shells are represented in many of the jewels but here, they are done in solid gold. A bracelet of onks indicating eternal life. The all-seeing eye also wrought in exquisite jewelry. A shield ring of Amun-Ra, the ram, 
protected by Isis with her wings. Another shield ring of Amun-Ra in front of a chapel. Amun-Ra once again exquisitely wrought with cowrie shells for a trim. The goddess Mut, who was the wife of Amun-Ra, is displayed on that bracelet as well as this ring wearing the crown. Goddess Mut again shown in this exquisite heavy bracelet. The cobras of the Nile protecting the royalty. The extent of the golden jewelry which was found in Queen Ashvakato's pyramid was very exquisite. This map shows the destroyed cities of ancient Nubia. These seal rings also show the philosophy of ancient Meroe, the king and queen with the prince. The king sitting on the throne administering the state. A lion-headed bumblebee, the vulture conquering enemies. The king is a lion, queen nursing the prince. Double-headed Mindalus with wings. The extent of the gold taken from Nubia will never be completely known, but looking at these royal golden seals, one begins to get an idea why Nubia was called the land of gold, and it was plundered for thousands of years. We are now on Lake Nasser, the Nubian Sea, taking a look at modern-day Nubia, the way it looks today. The ancient cities of Nubia are underwater, but we can see some of the remnants here as we begin to approach Kir Ibrim. Originally, Kir Ibrim was called the ancient Nubian city of Primus. This ancient fortress was the stronghold of the Kingdom of Kush, and after that, um, the Romans fought battles here with Queen Candace Amineris. A treaty was made at this place around 23 BC, the granite stela of which, which stands in the British Museum, we have shown you already. It is strikingly stark, the landscape. However, it still holds human habitation. But it is quite astounding that very little greenery exists in this place today, even though we are here surrounded by all this water. Presently, we are coming up to the ancient temples of Dhaka and the ancient temple of Amada. These temples date back over 4,000 years and were originally created in the Old Kingdom and then refurbished centuries later in the New Kingdom. This map shows the ancient locations of the ancient Nubian cities and temples. The white dots show the ancient locations of the temples and the red dots show where the temples were moved to to protect them from the inundations of the waters. However, one can see that much of Nubia, the habitable part of Nubia, is underwater for along the Nile was basically the only place where masses of habitation was permissible. Uh, these Nubian brothers are greeting us and helping us uh, descend from the boat. The ancient temple of Amada was refurbished by Ramses II in the 19th dynasty and was built upon the ruins of an older temple which had survived from the old kingdom. But all of these temples were built in Nubian cities and were built to show Egyptian propaganda. The amazing thing is that in the interior of the temples, the original paint still exists, showing 
that the Egyptians themselves, of course, uh, were African people, and that the uh, philosophies and religions along the Nile existed for thousands of miles in a continuous chain. Here we have the Ankh of Life being given to the Pharaoh by Amun-Ra. Amun-Ra in black, Amun-Min, god of fertility, flanked by Hathor. The Tree of Life, Ptah and his wife Sekhmet, goddess of war. The Pharaoh being given the key of life by the god. And here we are leaving the Temple of Amada, which we toured in more detail in the second installment of our Temples of Nubius series. We are now looking at the Temple of Dhaka. The Temple of Dhaka was rebuilt by Tutmosis III in the 18th dynasty, whereas the Temple of Amada was refurbished by Ramses II of the 19th dynasty. Our guide was telling us that the workmanship in the 18th dynasty was far superior to that of the 19th dynasty. And here we have the Pharaoh being blessed and baptized by the sacred waters, which, if you look carefully, are Ankhs. The workmanship is indeed exquisite. This conical hill looks suspiciously regular to be a natural formation. Is it an ancient pyramid? The vultures are flying by this reconstructed tomb of an ancient Egyptian viceroy of Nubia. And here is his family mourning his passage. Across the water on this hill, we see the Temple of Toth, built by the King Archimene of Cush in the third century BC. It used to stand in the ancient city of Aniba. Now we are in the Temple of Maharaka. Maharaka was actually built during the Roman era, but it was never finished and dressed with reliefs as are the other temples that we have seen. It was built in the first century AD. These tombs were about to be constructed to display Nubian relics, but the government decided to house those relics in the new Nubian museum being built in Aswan. Now we are taking an up-close look at the Temple of Toth, God of Wisdom, built by King Archimene. This temple was built in the third century BC and later refurbished by Pharaoh Ptolemy V two centuries later. Inside the temple, we can see that it adopts the conventions of the usual Egyptian temple with the solar disk and the cobras. The further toward the rear of the temple that we get, the clearer the reliefs are displayed. Obviously, there is some wear and tear after 2300 years. Sekhmet, goddess of war, addressing a king whose face has been removed. I wonder if it's in a museum somewhere. And here is Archimedes' queen. Her crown displays the distinctive Nubian tassels, which were not used by Egyptians historically. And here we have another relief of the Egyptian gods and goddesses and the headdress of a queen. The history of the people of the Nile is carved in stone in these places. Archimedes relief has been destroyed, but fortunately, many of the reliefs still show the features of the royalty. And here is the relief of King Archimene himself, showing his distinctive Nubian features. As we leave the temple, we are now approaching the temple of Wadi es Sabua. Wadi es Sabua was originally created by Pharaoh Amenophis III of the 18th dynasty, but was refurbished hundreds of years later by Ramses II of the 19th dynasty. 
Ramses added to the row of lion-headed sphinxes, which had been begun by Amenophis III. Ramses the second. Amenophis the third. Representations of Amenophis the third and Ramses the second are to be found in numerous museums in Egypt as well as London, New York, Paris, Berlin, and Florence. The pharaoh holding the hair of his captives, indicating his dominance. Ra Harakti, symbol of the king. We have toured the interior of the temple in our second video. In this video, we are giving you a tour of many Nubian temples. These paintings were done by David Roberts around 1837 when he toured the Nile. These Nubian women are being taken into slavery in the north by Arabs. Behind them, you see the Temple of Debode, which was transported to Spain when the High Aswan Dam flooded ancient Nubia. Now we have a look at the Nubian Sea. This representation of Thutmose III stands on the banks of the Thames River by a stela of Thutmose III. And this gentleman sits in the British Museum with his hair plaited in distinctive African style. This black granite statue of Isis shows her with Osiris. And this statue of goddess Hathor sits in the Luxor Museum. This is one of the lost temples, uh, which unfortunately could not be saved. And here I am shaking hands with the guide at Wadi Es Sabua. This is a 150-year-old photograph of the Temple of Philae, and this is a 150-year-old photograph of a Nubian woman. This is a 100-year-old seriograph of a 20-foot alligator by the old Temple of Philae. We are now in a small boat approaching the relocated Temple of Philae, the Temple of the Goddess Isis, which was relocated to higher ground near the city of Aswan when the High Aswan Dam was raised in 1970. Here we are being greeted by some of the local folks who are selling handicrafts. The magnificent courtyard of the Temple of Philae still bears watermarks from the years before the temple was relocated to higher ground. This temple was also shown in much greater detail in the third installment of our Temples of Nubia series. We are now seeing some of the exquisite reliefs in the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Isis. Uh, here is Isis with Hathor and Ma'at and the Pharaoh. Uh, this is a modern papyrus of Isis, Hathor, and Ma'at. This painting, done by David Roberts in 1838, interestingly shows the arches of the Temple of Osiris, which used to sit on its own island, now underwater, across from the Temple of Philae. These paintings of David Roberts show some of the ancient color which used to grace the columns and roof of the Temple of Philae, giving some idea of its ancient life. This is the interior of the Temple of Kalapsha. The Temple of Kalapsha was moved 50 miles north to its present location. That is the peace arch created for the Russians commemorating their assistance in building the high Aswan Dam. The temple upon which Kalapsha sits also now houses seven other ancient Nubian temples. This is the temple at Bet El Wali. From the veranda of the old Cataract Hotel, we are now looking at Elephantine Island and the Temple of Kanum. If you ever have a chance to take a felucca ride along the Nile at the first cataract, you should indeed avail yourself of that opportunity. 
because it is a very relaxing way to tour many ancient uh, relics. And this is the reconstructed courtyard of the Temple of Kanum, which was being reconstructed by the Egyptian tourist agency. Let's take a look in the Louvre and see if we can see any of the artifacts from the Temple of Kanum at Elephantine Island at Aswan and other African temples. the statue of Amenemet the second. This wall depicts the exploits of Pharaoh Tadmosis III. It actually talks about his conquest of various nations in the north, Palestine, Syria, Arabia, and the south, in Nubia, Tribune, and the Putin that he obtained in raiding and or taxing those areas, specifically horses, cattle, gold, lapis lily, and servants. Hathor. And Hathor's moor. Symbol of prosperity and love. And this fresco stone carving was taken from Elephantine Island and depicts Hatshepsut and Tutmosis III of the 18th dynasty. This inscription reads that Hatshepsut and or the 18th dynasty was ruled for a million Ra built in the days of Tutankhamun, 18th dynasty, 1340 BC. Amun Ra embracing Tutmosis IV, 1401 through 1390. 
B.C. taken from the Grand Temple of Amun-Ra. Part of the stone wall attributed to Pharaoh Pastamasis, 29th Dynasty, 664 B.C. Showing on the men who represents offerings at William Fort in Nubia. During the reign of Lorenz, was taken from Elephantine Island and shows tribute given to Tutmosis III from his Nubian territory. These temple blocks are taken from the old and now desolate temple at Elephantine Island, representing the conquest of Hatshepsut and Tutmosis III. Showing that indeed there was a magnificent temple there. And this too is an interesting representation of Hatshepsut wearing a white crown, the combination of the Hathor symbol, also taken from Elephantine Island. And this was, is a representation of the god Amara taken from that elephant. Another part of the ancient temple at Elephantine Island depicting Hatshepsut and Tutmosis III. As does this piece of the temple. Tutmosis III, as you can see by his cartouche, as he looked in his temple and this Moses the third from Elephantine Island. Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Looks like 18th Dynasty. Certainly has seen some wear and tear. Which used to stand there. Kanum is modeled after the ram, and the ram is the first symbol of the zodiac. The people of the Nile were great students and even the inventors of astrology and astronomy. And those symbols are very, very ancient and important here. Elephantine Island takes its name from the images of pachyderms carved by the river on the rocks and the extensive ivory trade that used to be conducted there. The history of the peoples of the Nile are carved upon these columns, which only hint at the ancient magnificence of this ancient temple. This village was constructed for Nubians who were relocated by the inundation of ancient Nubia. This statue of the Nubian general St. Morris stands in the courtyard of the Cathedral of Magdeburg, Germany. He was martyred for refusing to murder Christians at the order of the Roman Emperor in the 5th century AD. Thank you for taking this journey with us. See you next time. Mahalo.
Aloha. This special events program is brought to you by the Law Office of Attorney Daphne Barbie and the Office of Attorney Andre Wooten. We hope you enjoy it. Mahalo. <laughs> 